On this week's NFE SDN Reality Check, we talk with Centena Systems on the importance of service assurance for carriers as they deploy NFE and SDN platforms. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. Hello and welcome to this week's NFE SDN Reality Check. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we are joined by Anand Gunagudla, who is the CEO of Centina Systems, to talk a bit about uh, virtualization, NFE SDN, and how it relates to the uh, service assurance space. So, Anand, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on this uh, call. Great. Thanks so much. Well, maybe to start off with, uh, maybe for those who don't know much about the company, if you want to give us like, a little overview of what you guys do and how you guys... I guess, participate in the, in the telecom space. Sure, sure. Sentina Systems uh, was co-founded by myself uh, uh, and uh, two other gentlemen, Philip Doling and Paul Pintages, uh, about nine years ago. Uh, we've been uh, actually uh, started the company, grew the business to where we are today without taking any venture capital. Um, we have added over 25 different customers uh, around the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, frankly, I think uh, we've done a very good job of uh, getting our message out there with related to service assurance for uh, traditional networks. Uh, and most recently, we have done uh, several uh, developments uh, in the SD and NFE area. Uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, definitely setting the trend for us. Uh, so in a nutshell, we've been growing. Uh, it's been an exciting time for us. Great. Well, obviously, the virtualization thing is something we cover here quite a bit on the show. And sure. it does seem like from in the past, the companies I've talked to, a lot of operators, it seems like a lot of them are looking at kind of their service assurance uh, platforms as maybe even one of the first places where they're going to start using virtualization because it seems like a nice uh, way to, for them to really, uh, uh, I guess, to provide some increased agility, uh, some scalability to those, to those platforms. And, you know, as you look at kind of how NFV and SDN impact, uh, uh, I guess, the service assurance space, I mean, what's your view on on how you guys are using you know this virtualization to kind of improve or or kind of I guess change your own your own platforms. Sure, sure. Uh, there are actually several uh, key areas uh, that uh, we're making improvements uh, in the existing uh, uh, assurance platforms. Uh, one of the key uh, promises of uh, SD and NFE is to get the new systems to be DevOps ready. Yep. Uh, so one thing we're doing is we're wrapping entire uh, solution with REST API. Uh, in essence, uh, not only our internal development teams can make improvements on our platform, but we would be extending that capability to our service provider customers as well. Uh, other areas is uh, yeah, pre-integrations with the ODL or uh, uh, OpenStack or yep. any other uh, open platforms. So when we roll out our platform, we kind of fit into the ecosystem that's already out there. Um, the one other key aspect that changes dramatically with the NFE and SDN is what is a service? Service mm-hmm. is a very, very nebulous thing here. Um, historically, carriers are selling bit, uh, bandwidth or uh, a set of uh, services, and uh, those are fairly well defined. And uh, during the lifetime of the service, they tend to be fairly static. Mm-hmm. Uh, with SDN and NFE, the promise is uh, the agility and the robustness, uh, and, and also the service on demand. Uh, so, so you need to be able to model a service that's uh, rather uh, could be anything. It could be an application. It could be an application that's working on a virtual compute platform, which is hosted on a, on a data center, uh, and could be changing over a period of time. So understanding the service, modeling the service, and be able to comprehend what has uh, What's going on in the service uh, at this moment and also in the past is very critical uh, with SDN and NFE. So there's uh, quite a bit of uh, analytics and visualization capabilities we're adding towards that. And also some of the holistic monitoring. You know, typically it used to be more of a physical asset. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you got to look at uh, the virtual slash physical assets because physical assets are not going away. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, so, so you can't ignore what uh, is already in the ecosystem but you need to accommodate what's coming uh, for enabling the growth. Um, and uh, last, uh, last but not, not least is the, the ability to export. Uh, the, one of the strengths of uh, Assurance System is we are actually live connected to the network yep. and the infrastructure. So we, ha- we collect a, a lot of uh, intelligent data and we neutralize that data. So, and that data is very, very critical for big data platforms. 
yeah. uh, almost every operator has made a big investment on their big data platform, but getting the right quality in the data is a challenge for them. So we're able to give them a feed uh, from our platform. Uh, so now you give them access to the data that's in the network, that's mm -hmm. in real time, mm -hmm. and uh, you give them the visualization that they need to be able to understand what is now and what happened over the last uh, uh, number of hours mm -hmm. and uh, wrap that with the REST API, it's a quite a powerful story uh, with respect to how we enable them to do what they need to do um, real time. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point because it does seem like, I mean, the, the, like you said, the benefits of virtualization are uh, the agility of it and the robustness of it. And it seems like those are two very important parts to kind of the service assurance model. I mean, you want to be able to provide operators with, uh, you know, with what's happening in the network almost in near real time if possible. Right. Obviously, that requires a lot of automation, uh, things that kind of re happen rapidly, uh, and operators need to be able to, to quickly adjust uh, their operations and also just the sure. flow of information. It seems like, again, that virtualization seems to be uh, a, a great step in that direction. I'm guessing for you guys, you're seeing some, some potential great benefits of, of being able to use this to kind of really improve your system. Right. Well, I think uh, from our perspective, obviously, it gives us a, an opportunity to play yeah. in uh, some of the environments we could not play uh, yeah. before. Um, you know, service assurance has been uh, there as long as we know carry your business. Um, our uh, past, uh, most recent last five years success has been more with the traditional operations. Yep. Uh, most of the larger uh, uh, environments had legacy systems embedded and they were not, not, there was not much interest in transitioning to newer investments. Yeah. With SD and NFE, all of that is changing. So from, for me, the biggest excitement with SD and NFE is the ability to play. Uh, the field uh, in the assurance space with the larger operators. Got it. Got it. I was saying, as you mentioned earlier, too, you guys do seem to be embracing kind of the open model of this, too, the open stack, uh, kind of opening that part of it. It does seem like that's, again, kind of been able to uh, allow a lot more companies to play in this space. I know, you know, with AT&T, for instance, with their, with a lot of the stuff that they're doing, they're trying to really embrace the open model and kind of bring in new players. So it does seem like the operators as well are embracing this, which is allowing, yeah. it seems like, new vendors to really come in and be players in the, players in the space. Right, and I think for a first, first time in the history, the operators are also <laughs> trying to be the developers, right? They're, they're actually contributing to the community. Um, and in fact, you see uh, service providers all over the place hiring and actually buying yeah. uh, small and nimble software houses so they can actually enhance the platform. Uh, but but uh, that said, you know, they're also willing to entertain uh, players that have some unique offerings to so they get a end-to-end -end package, uh, some homegrown, some open source, some from a third party. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. No, I guess for your own platforms in internally there, I mean, what, has there been any sort of challenge, I guess, in trying to migrate from perhaps, perhaps more of the legacy types of systems like maybe, when you guys maybe first started out to maybe this new virtualized world? I mean, is there, are there stuff that you guys have to do internally? I'm obviously, obviously, I'm sure there's more software people involved and getting stuff involved there. But, you know, I guess any sort of challenges you've seen and how you've kind of, I guess, come over uh, gotten over some of those issues and making sure you know, that your legacy system is now able to kind of be this new, this new virtualized world? Well, I, I guess uh, for us, there's not a whole lot of legacy okay. uh, since uh, we are relatively a new player uh, in the space. So we didn't have to migrate a whole bunch from okay. uh, legacy to current environment. Um, the biggest challenge with uh, SDN NFE is the hype. Okay. <laughs> right. So talking to the uh, media here, I know all about that. I know what you're saying. <laughs> right. Right. So, so the how much is reality, and uh, and uh, what is that exactly that one need to do to enable uh, the business that's going to take place in the next 12 to 18 months is the challenge. Um, and of course, you know, with with our background and uh, our knowledge of the industry, we're able to put those uh, uh, things together. But even for a service provider, it's uh, quite a task uh, to, one, sniff through the competition, understanding which service they launch, and more importantly, put in place an architecture uh, for their uh, systems where they're not stuck to it. In yeah. They're not married to it for the next 10 years. They should be, the fact it's agile, they need to be able to plug and play, um, remove any piece that they want, and they need to reinsert uh, without breaking the entire ecosystem. Uh, so, so I think the challenge is to be, really be able to package our uh, components in a way um, that are addressing today's challenges, yet giving the confidence to our customers that uh, we do have the visibility uh, into the future. We do have the roadmap that can address what is coming. 
Yeah, great point. Yeah, I mean, obviously the hype management part of it is a big part of this, I think, oh, just in general. I mean, I know talking to companies last year, everybody was talking about 2015 as being, you know, this great year for deployments and it's going to be just boosting it. But really, it seems like 2015 is more of the hype management year. Right. And, you know, 2014. Well, we're we're seeing uh, small rollouts. But, yeah. uh, you, you know, if you look at uh, how many of them are in uh, full force production, how many actual end customers are utilizing that infrastructure, it's still very small. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely still in the, in the proof of concept uh, stage, it seems like, where it's a lot of those POC agreements going on, working right. with the, we make sure everything works together, and that's just part of the process, it seems like, too. Sure, sure. And I, I, think, I think that's uh, well said. In fact, uh, there's a lot of promising technologies on the network itself mm -hmm. uh, that could be virtualized, and uh, those uh, products are available from a number of different vendors. There's a ton of interest from uh, venture and private equity communities to invest in the space, which is a great thing for telecom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, carriers are very excited too. You know, it's one opportunity for them to really revamp their uh, infrastructure and compete well with the over-the-top providers um, and, and build a new business model. So I think there is something in it for everybody, and that's why this is such an exciting story. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. You obviously, yeah, because the carriers are almost, it seems like, driving this model. I mean, again, sure. you know, a lot of the, the, the legacy type of, of systems are oftentimes driven by the vendor community, perhaps, pushing right. new things, you know, new products here and there. But it seems like this is really being almost pulled from the, from the carrier's point of view because they do want this kind of change and sort of agility, like you said, to kind of compete against the OTT guys and companies like that. So it seems like it's, it's great for the vendors because you have a built-in market, really. You're not having to really, really sell stuff. I mean, or else or this, not sell the idea. Because they already want, they, they like the idea. It's just a matter, right. you know, getting the right product to the to the customers. And it's right, fitting into their vision, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I guess how is the ecosystem working together as well? Because it does seem like again there are a lot of new, a lot of new companies involved, a lot of legacy companies involved, a lot of carriers involved. Obviously, uh, it seems like a lot of players all trying to kind of orbit this uh, NFV SDN space. And you know, again, we're still working working on standards and things like that too. I guess as you look at the model today and the market today, I mean, I guess how are we working? How's the how's the industry working together and making sure everything kind of does at the end of the day play play well together? The 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 elements that are in the virtualized space, yeah, um, you can you can actually see it as a three different components. One is uh, network itself that can be virtualized and uh, various NFE functions that are being introduced by incumbent operators and also legacy operators and, and, and also some of the new uh, companies that are coming to the play. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of it is really the orchestration of it. Uh, that's where you, know, you, you see a lot of uh, open platforms, yeah. uh, some that are actually newly announced by different vendors. Uh, and, and, the, and the last piece is really the assurance and the, the operation support systems around it. Yeah. I say most of the action so far has been taken place on understanding what are the uh, business drivers and what is the ROI introducing a specific NFE function into the network. I think uh, um, almost most of the operators are settling in on one or two, three different services that they could launch. Mm -hmm. and the second thing was orchestration. Obviously, when you introduce a new service, you need to be able to provision it. You need to be able to monetize it. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is now ample choice uh, from orchestration perspective. Mm -hmm. There are commercially available products, there are open source products uh, that could be enhanced uh, by a specific operator. And, and, the, and the now, just about now, we're kind of going in the mode of launching new services that are actually being sold to the end customers mm -hmm. at a quantity. And we're seeing a lot of interest in the assurance side of it because now, now is when they need to actually, the service providers have to train uh, their staff uh, to not only deliver the service, but also understand the full life cycle management uh, of the service. Now, I wish the ecosystems were a lot stronger mm -hmm. that encompass all of this. Um, however, what I do see is there are fairly limited ecosystems that are available there. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it was really towards the uh, virtualization component itself, for example, Intel and the number of uh, uh, OS vendors and, and also some of the NFV providers like uh, you know open switch type yeah. of uh, products uh, they, they did create uh, uh, some um, uh, some sort of uh, a platform where they could all work and collaborate together but that hasn't really transpired into how do we deliver end-to-end -end service really that challenge is still with the uh, the service providers and thus we're actually working directly with the service providers and their chosen uh, um, integration partners 
Yeah, great point there, Alec, because I know we've talked to a lot of different companies on the show here, and it does seem like there are lots of these little organizations that have been set up to kind of handle uh, small slices of this overall right. pie. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, the carriers want to make sure that all these slices at the end of the day form the same pie and not different right. a different kind of pie. So, uh, and talking to carriers, that's been one of their concerns is making sure that, you know, that there is this in, end-to-end solution that can be actually uh, d- uh, deployed that, that works at the end because, again, carriers have their – their carrier grade uh, uh, requirements and things like that too. So yeah, that's a great point that there are a lot of a lot of uh, entities working on this, but hopefully at the end of the day, uh, they all communicate uh, correctly with each other. I, I think carriers are driving that, frankly. <laughs> I, I don't think there's one body that's actually yeah. putting it all together. The large vendors are able to do that too. Uh, yeah. They're showcasing in their labs a combination of these, but it's not like a open forum where every vendor can take their uh, solution into that package. Mm-hmm. You got to have a fairly strong working relationship with the um, vendor uh, to be able to be in that lab and be able to integrate into that ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like, too, again, like the, the service assurance part of this seems like such a major component because it does seem like initially at least the carriers are targeting perhaps uh, enterprise customers, for instance, with their virtualized platforms. And those are customers that are pretty high value customers. That's right. So you have to make sure that, that what you're rolling out while being new uh, pretty much works perfectly because you don't want to lose those customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, a, that's one asset uh, carriers have is they're known for their reliability and availability, right? No, nothing can touch carrier. Uh, no matter how much uh, people say, they are willing to rely on operators to deliver quality service, right? Yes. So, so with uh, virtualization, I think a uh, number of things are going to be challenging for carriers. Uh, there, there are organizational issues, yeah. uh, there are people and the training issues, and also system level issues. And, and, um, and uh, the virtual service has multiple dimensions as well. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, with the time, things change. Uh, what, how the service is delivered and what are the dependencies for the service to be functional is all trend, is, uh, is uh, changing. Mm-hmm. And this is all, all the decision making is now is uh, driven off of the orchestration platforms. So there's no human essentially involved in the process of committing a, a resource or decommitting a resource, mm-hmm. right? So now, however, when things don't, work as they're supposed to, uh-huh. uh, a human notices it and they call a human on the, on the customer support line. And that human need to be able to understand what the machines have decided to do. <laughs> um, and, and it takes, a, it takes a, and the fact it's multidimensional and there are a lot of dependencies, uh, somebody need to be able to very quickly be able to visualize, analyze, uh, and be able to get to the bottom of it. And given that it's a brand new service, you would expect to see some kinks, uh, and they need to be able to rework those kinks by uh, by understanding how machines are making these decisions. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think service assurance will be huge in terms of uh, uh, be able to visualize, uh, be able to uh, troubleshoot, mm-hmm. uh, not just what's happening at that moment, but actually be able to go back in the past a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, understanding uh, the capacity management aspects of it. Uh, if, if, if I made a big investment in terms of a, a data center and I'm delivering a set of services, I need to be able to understand uh, at what point things are not going to work uh, and how, how much am I getting ROI-wise? You know, am I getting the most out of the, my, that investment? Uh, so I think assurance becomes a... Uh, quite a important element of uh, the end-to-end service. And I, I think almost all the carriers have acknowledged it at this yeah. point. We're, we're getting pretty decent traction in terms of uh, getting our story out there. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's a, it's a, the timing of this is also interesting because again, it's, you know, a lot of these operators are going towards uh, some new networks and obviously there's a lot of talk about 5G and what's involved with that and people are planning for that, but it seems like uh, virtualization is going to be a core part of that. Uh, but along with that, too, there are all these different network elements that are coming online that seem to maybe can, can complicate the service assurance aspect. Because, again, it's not just a single network anymore being uh, tasked with you know, providing services. It's, it's now these new components of the network being part of it. And, and it seems like the service assurance platform is now to take into account uh, a lot more that's going on out there. And, and again, provide it in near instantaneous, you know, uh, real time for, for carriers so they can make quick, quick adjustments or quick decisions on what's happening, but also in a way that allows the human that's involved to, like you said, realize what's going on because, you know, again, computers can uh, probably speak a little different language than humans do a lot of the times. 
So right. being able to, to parse that out has got to be a, a big challenge. I mean, especially, you know, the next few years will be a, a tough way to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you have VCPE service, yeah. virtual CPE, which is really serving the uh, end business customer, an enterprise type of customer, yeah. where you're actually hosting a number of different services on a single uh, commodity-based platform. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that really, if you kind of back that up into the network, you know, there could be a number of elements that could be virtualized as well there. Sure. Um, and then you also have, you know, you mentioned about 5G, uh, or even 4G, really yeah, sure. 4G plus. Um, but essentially, you're taking a number of uh, uh, elements within the core, mobile core, that you want to scale up and down depending on the uh, demands uh, of the day. And, and that's another area. There's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, evaluations that are being done in IMS core, in the mobile core. And, and uh, these are very, very important areas. And uh, Again, assurance means what, what does it mean in each of these areas uh, could vary in terms of uh, what KPIs you monitor and what are the dependencies. How does a service look in these categories will be different. Uh, however, the, the, the bottom line, the ability to troubleshoot, uh, the ability to understand what's going on in the infrastructure at that moment and also over the uh, past a few days uh, is critical. Uh, and be able to even assure from SLA management perspective mm -hmm. uh, a changing multi-dimensional resource mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is, is also very critical uh, for the next-gen assurance for the virtual networks. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, I guess how, how comfortable are, I guess, how do you see uh, the, the current platforms out there, including yours, being able to support this, this move towards virtualization? I mean, are, are you guys pretty confident that, that what you guys can offer and what's being offered out there is is pretty much you know uh, production ready and ready to go out into the market and and support or are we still trying to maybe fine tune a few things here and there to make sure it's really ready for for commercial deployments? I, I can definitely speak about uh, Centina yeah. Systems. Uh, we we have uh, one advantage. We are a newer vendor yeah. uh, that has uh, established over the last uh, eight nine years. Uh, when we started here, we didn't know SDN and FE could exist, right? It, it was not even on the, on, the, on the radar. However, we put in an architecture in place uh, uh, that was taking into account uh, most of the newer technologies mm -hmm. in terms of scale, presentation, analytics. Um, however, in the, in the last 24 months, we made a conscious effort uh, to invest in the direction of getting uh, the product ready for the virtual asset management. Mm -hmm. uh, for the SD and NFE. So, for example, uh, you know, when we say REST API, we're not talking about bits and pieces of uh, the product. It's 100% of the product. Uh, anything we can do with our UI on our product, our customers can do using our REST API. Okay. So, uh, so those type of investment uh, we, we, we made uh, by choice, uh, whether it's uh, ODL integration, OpenStack integration, uh, service modeling or the analytics engine that we put in place uh, or the big data integration. Uh, these are areas where we actually categorically chose to make those investments. And I, I'm very comfortable. Uh, we are ready for the prime time. We can actually go into a production environment today. Uh, we, we've been uh, kicking tires in uh, different proof of concepts. Uh, we have several production systems uh, that are not quite, I would say, virtual. We are managing some virtual assets, mm -hmm. but not, not, not as, uh, as uh, openly as uh, a specific NFE type of environment. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, but uh, w but uh, we, we have a, a platform that's ready to go. Got it, got it. Now, I guess as you look at the overall ecosystem for virtualization, is that still perhaps lagging a bit behind perhaps maybe where you guys are, maybe where some, some systems are? I mean, does it seem like the operators are are on board for this, or how do you see the whole overall ecosystem kind of uh, coming along, at least timing-wise? I, I think, I think timing-wise, I see a good, uh, good uh, consummation actually towards the end of this year. Okay. Uh, well, but like I said, uh, I feel market has enough components to offer on the network side itself. Yep. Uh, uh, on the orchestration, I think uh, for what we need to do in the next twelve months, I think mm -hmm. we're ready. Okay. Um, now, like I said, the fact. Uh, the moment we said we want to have an agile and robust platform, you cannot plan for the next 10 years. <laughs> you got to plan for the next 18 months. Sure, sure. Um, and, and, and you need to have systems in place that can enable you to enhance without yeah. worrying about the next 10 years. Uh, so from that perspective, I believe the network side, orchestration side, and assurance side, uh, market is ready. It's really going to be which carrier is going to go 
uh, big on it. Uh, I think there you see statements from all the key operators that they're very keen on it. Uh, but you know, proof is in the pudding. You know, <laughs> let's say go to the middle of next year and see how far each of them have gone. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Because it seemed like, you know, earlier this year at the Mobile World Congress event back in, in Barcelona, a lot of talk about it. But uh, again, I think we're still waiting to see, see some traction. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Like you said, maybe over the next six months or so, I'm guessing leading up to, to next year's event, uh, you know, we'll see which operators have kind of right. made the next push. Because again, there have been a few that have been very vocal, but uh, still kind of waiting for that momentum to really build, it seems, uh, towards towards kind of that, that, that end goal, I guess. I know it's still probably a few years away for the, for the end goal, but at least moving that way. Right. I think the interest is there yeah. with almost every operator. Yeah. Even the guys that are non-believers, yeah. they want to listen and understand what's going on. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, really there are handfuls of operators that are really going ga gangbusters in terms of making those investments. Yeah. Uh, and I think a big part of that is uh, those, uh, those uh, the front runners will uh, determine how much of uh, the market will sway in the direction. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's really the exciting part in the next six months to me is uh, how much of this is going to really see the fruition end of the light. And, and that should really enable another hundred operators to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Now I've talked to some of the carriers who've been very vocal about this and, and that's been kind of their concern is, you know, they, they are kind of the, the kind of breaking the, the, the trail here for this, which is can, can be a little scary, but they're also able to shape what that trail looks like. I mean, they're able to really kind of bring on board what they want to do. Uh, which, you know, again, their competitors will have to probably at some point follow as well because once this is kind of a broken right. trail, people want to be on that trail and just be easier for the vendor community to work along the same routes too. So it's an interesting time right now for that. No, I agree. 100% uh, on board with it. Yeah. Uh, that's why I think it's important for those leaders uh, to not only be successful but also be willing to share their data yeah. uh, to the rest of the world so everybody can get on the bandwagon. Yeah. And does it seem like that, that, that people are pretty open to that at this point? I mean, I know I've talked to, again, like I said, a few of the companies, and it do seem like they're trying to be open about it. Are you seeing it from the vendor side that, that companies are still fairly open when it comes to kind of sharing what they've got <laughs> behind uh, the scenes? Or? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know about the vendor community. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I said, there is so much hype and everybody yeah. is uh, kind of jogging. They're, you know, they, they want their position. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, also, you know, there's, a, like I said, a lot of hype cycle there. Yeah. So you, you got to really figure out where you fit and people don't want to expose what they don't have. <laughs> uh, so for Centina, it's a rather simple task because we have a single solution. Uh, we're a very focused company. Uh, so I can clearly say what I have, what I don't. But if, if you're an incumbent and you're a large vendor, you don't want to say that. <laughs> Right? You want to provide all of it. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think on the vendor community, I don't know if there's all that much sharing going on yeah. unless they have this uh, labs and an ecosystem yeah. where they're verifying into end solution. But I think carriers seem to be very open about it. They're, they're, they're telling people what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and to some extent, uh, like I said, there are only a handful of operators that are making strikes. Um, you know, no more than 10 operators. Yeah. Essentially. Uh, so so they, they're so big. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, in fact, they're also putting some pressure back on the vendor community, on the entire ecosystem, to get on the bandwagon, right? Uh, so I think it's a, really a win-win in that context. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Well, Anand, thanks so much for the great insight on this today. Obviously, this is an industry uh, that is changing rapidly, and for you guys in the service insurance space, uh, an important part of this as well, obviously, like we were saying earlier, I mean, this is an important part for operators to make sure that they, that they get this part of it right because at the end of the day, service assurance is a pretty big part of what they're trying to do. They want to, you know, they've got uh, a history of providing uh, strong services and make sure the network's always working. So this is a big part of what they're trying to do. And, and going to new technologies, that's going to be a big, a big component of this as well. Right, right. And then one, one last point yeah. I want to make, Dan, is uh, really there are two important disruptions with okay. uh, NFE. From uh, end of the day, everything is to enable the end user. Mm -hmm. Any technology we invent is to enable the end user. Um, one thing that uh, the end user really likes about this is uh, service on demand. Yep. Their ability to do things without having to wait for it. You know, we love it, right? When we buy on Amazon or uh, it's the same thing you can extend to an enterprise. You know, I want to buy a service. I don't need to wait for two weeks. I'll get what I need. And the, and the second biggest disruption is uh, an enterprise ability to integrate their applications with a carrier network and mm -hmm. leverage that power of that network. You know, the, the, the comparison I give is uh, very much like uh, 
uh, what Apple did uh, with the, the app infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? They, they created a sandbox environment where everybody can go put their apps on it. Uh, and and uh, this is very similar. You know, if, if this uh, whole SDN NFT sandbox is created by the operator and that power could be leveraged by the enterprises and the creativity of the enterprises uh, to be able to do things that were never envisioned in the past. And I think these two disruptions are real. No matter okay. what happens to the hype cycle, how things get delivered uh, by the carrier and the vendor ecosystem. And, and as long as we stay focused on those two disruptions, uh, I think we'll see, we'll see good results. Um, and, and whether it's assurance or orchestration or virtual functions, all of them will be very, very successful. Yeah, and it seems like those kind of disruptors, though, they also do require, like you were saying earlier, I mean, they require the community to remain open to allowing other people to kind of come in and play in the sandbox. I mean, you can't just uh, put the big walls around and not let everybody come in there and play right. with enterprises or other vendors. You kind of have to let everybody uh, get some of that sand to, uh, to make something with. So that, that seems oh. like that's going to be a big part of this going forward, is making sure that that remains an open, open part of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why, that's why whatever systems we put in place, uh, they would be open. Uh, the, the, whether it's the REST API that I talked about, the DevOps readiness, uh, and I think uh, all other systems that are going to be in play would also be uh, somewhat uh, compli in compliant with the, that approach. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, great. Well, again, on, on. definitely appreciate the time on this today. Again, very interesting topic, and uh, I'm sure we'll be catching up with you guys again soon on the, on the topic as well. But uh, thanks so much for the time today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks, everyone, for watching this week's NFE SD Rally Check. And make sure to check us out again next week. I'll do that. All right. Bye. NFV SDN Reality Check with Dan Meyer is a production of RCR TV. To suggest show topics or to reach Dan, you can find him on email dmeyer at rcrwireless.com and on Twitter at Meyer underscore Dan. For more Dan, news on NFV SDN and everything wireless, find your way over to rcrwireless.com.